Hey world, welcome to another edition of Tandem Tactics Podcast. I am Dan Brown, as always, with my friends... Tao and Garrett. And we're switching up the format a little bit here, rather than trying to walk you through each and every turn um, of one game, like hyper-focusing on each uh, little intricacy of it. We have instead played three games... Mm -hmm already and we're gonna try to focus on like the big fish stories from those games like oh in this one turn i did this thing but it got countered and we had a huge stack right i think usually uh when i've been playing edh people tend to switch decks between games right right um because uh, i think most people don't want to get bored but yeah. playing the same game with the same decks a few times uh you really get to see how the strategy can develop from game to game and how some players can uh, learn from their mistakes from the previous game. Also, before we get going, um, one last thing. I, I think that this is going to be on iTunes by the time that this is published. So check the link in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to um, download the podcast onto your device for consumption away from a computer, that is now a possibility. Uh, check the description for... More info. I played my Mimeoplasm combo deck. It was in a previous video, um, but I figured I would give it a second shot because it ended up losing that game. So uh, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, you know, prove yourself. Yeah, exactly. Prove it a little bit. The Mimeoplasm is a uh, an ooze, a legendary creature ooze for um, two, a green, a blue, and a black. When it enters the battlefield, um, you may exile two creatures from any graveyard. Um, if you do, it enters the battlefield as a copy of one with plus one plus one counters equal to the power of the second creature. So it kind of squishes them together and the art's kind of cool because it's like a dinosaur arm <laughs> and then it's like this little like oozy guy coming out. Honestly though, like I, I don't think, I, I didn't cast him in all three of the games. Um, my real general is Necrotic Ooze, yeah. which uh, is, a t is another ooze, um, <laughs> but this one is uh, two and two black for a 4-3 that when, it, when it's in, in play, it has all activated abilities of all creatures in my graveyard. So um, it, it, there are a bunch of different creatures that I gain benefit from being in my graveyard at any point. One of the things that I uh, we did after the first video is we posted our uh, decks on Tapped Out, and mm -hmm. um, so somebody actually commented on it, and they asked me about like a bunch of quick questions about why some cards were in it, why some cards weren't in it, and uh, somebody asked me about Consecrated Sphinx and Jinkataxis. Not actually sure how Tapped Out works, if they can actually read it, if they see it or not, like yeah, Facebook I'm, or I'm something. I'm not super well versed right. in Tapped Out. Like there's a whole social layer to it that I just don't use. Right. <laughs> so sometimes my decks have like really low scores because I don't put like any description in there so whatever but it's, yeah. yeah so they asked me about Jinka Texas and uh, Consecrated Sphinx and I, did, I didn't include those two just because um, playing with uh, Dan and Tao we're not going to let Jinka Texas force us to discard our hands right Right. but also you expect to win the game when you reanimate right. I mean I, I don't need the, the, Sphinx the huge, and, yeah. and Jinka Texas are powerful but they're like, let's win in two or three turns, and why would you do that if you can just win right there? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I built a new deck uh, around uh, Jaleva, Nefalia Scourge. Well, new new for me. She's been around since 2013. Right. Jaleva is a 1-3 flying vampire wizard for a 1, a blue, a black, and a red. Uh, when Jaleva enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top X cards of his or her library, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast Jaleva, so she's one of the 2013 commanders whose effects grows uh, the more times that you cast her from the command zone. And then whenever Jaleva attacks, you may cast an instant or sorcery card exiled with it without paying its mana cost. So there's a little bit of an aspect of cheating a big spell into play, and so there are a bunch of seven, eight converted mana cost spells in my deck. But uh, she's mainly there as kind of a disruptive element. Uh, sometimes I can grab a spell that's not in my color identity and cast it for great effect. And sometimes it can just exile uh, random cards from my opponent's library and have to make them rethink how to play out the game. Right, we're playing against two combo decks today. <laughs> you think you think that might become relevant at some point? I don't know, Spo spoiler alert, question mark? <laughs> um, and I specifically built this that to be kind of um, a little more on the casual side. I've been going to a couple of uh, play groups during the week where the metagame is a, a little more casual. Well, there's a really cool spot in New York called the Atrium. It's this privately owned public space. So it's like really neutral ground. There's no business with an ax to grind or trying to sell you stuff. It's just people meet up there on Monday nights to play Commander. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a more casual, usually metagame. If, if you ask around for a competitive game, you can usually scrounge uh, you know, three or four other people together. I've also been going to this other store in New York City called The Uncommons, mm -hmm. um, which is downtown. And the highlights of those metagames are 
usually you'll get a very broad range of players from like people new and learning to play the game up to people with some pretty powerful decks, but usually no one trying to do something completely broken. I wanted to have a deck that could go there and play a very interactive game. And so Jaleva's point was, you know, she can steal spells from your opponents. And so you kind of have to see what they offer. Um, the deck is packed with commands and charms so that uh, I have lots of different options throughout the game. Mostly, uh, it's going to use an opponent's deck to uh, beat them up with like <laughs> bribery or acquire or just Jaleva stealing spells and trying to act like as a spoiler for anyone who's trying to combo off um, with a lot of instant speed removal and instant speed answers. And I uh, today ran Progenogus. It's the deck that I uh, featured in my most recent tech deck deck tech. Um, it also went 6-0 and in pods at Grand Prix DC, although playing with people who know what the deck does is an inherent disadvantage, because one of the things it does very well is kind of, you know, bluff, and opponents might not, who, who haven't played against it before, might not read into what exactly we're doing. So uh, if, if you've never seen it before, it's easier for me to win, and that's part of why I went 6-0. Progenitus um, is a 10-10 legendary Hydra avatar uh, that costs white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green. Two of every color of mana. Um, and it has protection from everything. <laughs> uh, which basically means it can't be targeted by anything. Um, it, it can still be destroyed by like board wipes. That's the best way to get rid of it. But it can't be blocked. It won't take damage from anything when it does block them. Um, I normally don't even cast it. Uh, it's just there, one is a lark to you know, kind of a bluff to make people think I'm gonna try to win the game that way, but uh, instead normally we're trying to combo off uh, somewhere else. It's, it's basically there for its colors. It's a version of the deck that I played in the last Tandem Tactics, the, the Chromat build with Azusa is a hidden commander, but I basically worked out the kinks in it. There were some things that weren't quite working right with the, the uh, Chromat Azusa version. Um, and now, you know, I basically put back in more combos, more ways to tutor for the combos. And it's just got, you know, <laughs> more consistent ways to close out games with the same basic engine of, you know, all 10 of the Ravnica crews that tap for multiple mana, ways to make those tap for even more, like a Fertile Ground or a Market Festival. Um, and then, you know, we untap those with little green mana dorks um, and just generate a lot of mana. <laughs> I think I went first and you went first the first two games that's true yeah i was great at rolling dice today i guess <laughs> and my opening hand was basically lots of lands and a time spread a time stretch and a time spiral so I, I wasn't didn't have a ton of direction not a lot of interaction not much to do in the early game it was probably in hindsight a mistake to keep it and at the time even then i, I was thinking maybe i shouldn't but i just kind of wanted to start playing um and some of those lands were scry lands and bounce lands so i knew i could you know filter the top of my library um a little bit but my early game wasn't that particularly exciting i don't know how you guys felt about your uh, opening hands in game one. I had uh, lots of removal, and um, one thing I've been trying to do is like make a mental note and not use my answers. The second I feel like I need to kind of huh. play, take a step back a little bit it's and um, sa sandbag. Exactly, sandbag them. Yeah. For that. Um, so I had a couple answers, a couple of good cards, and I figured I, it was a fairly decent hand that I, you know, thought I could get there with. I have a book on my shelf. It's called Wait: The Art and Science of Delay. Right. It's talking about how in like life. Generally, it's usually to your benefit to wait as long as possible to make a decision. Um, and that concept definitely applies uh, to games of Commander. So to the audience and to you, Garrett. It's an interesting tension in EDH strategy because um, if you've played uh, at all competitively one-on-one one -on -one in any of the other formats, right. one of the principles that you kind of adhere by or one of the heuristics that you use of like, am I making the right play, is am I using all of my man uh, whenever possible right. because I, I think uh, I, I learned a while ago that with like TCGs the player who wins is often the player who spends the most mana yep. that game I was once taught all things being equal spend your mana as best as possible right. and so it, when it gets to uh, the end step of the player right before you you have mana up you have an instant speed something yeah. and your thought is I should just cast this now on the best target that there is because next turn I might draw more stuff and I can spend more mana and get further ahead. Right, it's the idea that if you leave lands untapped, you have wasted a resource, effectively. Right. Sometimes just passing is the right play because 
you having mana open actually suppresses the mana that other people can spend because right. they don't want to they don't want to play something into your answer or into your trick. I'm looking at your notes and on turn five, <laughs> uh, you cast a time spiral. For six mana, four blue blue, each player shuffles their hand and graveyard into their library and draws seven new cards, and then the person who cast it gets to untap six of their lands, which um, in Progenitus often nets us extra mana. It doesn't just pay for itself. Mm -hmm. It um, is a little bit more. So, right, I cast a time spiral on turn five, right? right. I cho chose to do that instead of a Cyclonic Rift, which... Felt like maybe it was a mistake even at the time, but the spirit of this first game, you know, if you remember my opening hand, I didn't love it, but I was just like, yeah, we'll see what happens. So the time spiral was another, eh, we'll see what happens sort of decision. Time spiral threatens to uh, replace all of our hands. Right. And um, even though we're drawing seven cards, the, the cards that you have in your hand right now are kind of sculpted. I have mana to do one of these two things. Uh, I have a shred memory, uh, which uh, is one in a black, um, remove up to four target cards in a single graveyard from the game. By the way, it also has transmute for one in black, black. Um, and the reason why this card is important is because it's a, um, it locks down Garrett's ability to combo, at least the first time. I could use this now in response to the time spiral, but I think at the, this point I would have exiled an important combo piece. But because it's not in response to a combo, it's not as... Um, Juicy. It's not as juicy, it's not as backbreaking to you for right. the game. I also have my own Cyclonic Rift in hand, which I think I could have used to bounce one of your untappers. Right, one, one, one of mine back to my hand, which then would have been shuffled into my library because of my Time Spiral, right? Neither of which, neither of which was great, because I didn't think you were casting Time Spiral to win the game. So I decided uh, I'm going to let these kind of mediocre answers go hope to draw into something better, and then if you're going to do anything more threatening that turn, I'll have drawn into better answers. Yeah. It turns out I didn't draw into any answers. I didn't draw <laughs> into anything to instant speed. Um, and that's a decision I don't know if it was right or wrong. What would you do? Like, you have a removal spell in response to any kind of wheel effect. I think you're about to lose an answer with mana up. It's going to get replaced. I think it depends on how threatening you think we, both of us are. Well, and it depends on how many removal spells you run in your deck. If I was playing my Aloro build, for example, which is very controlly, and I can assume I'm going to draw into another spell, then I probably don't bother spending the mana to get rid of this sort of whatever threat. This, it's not really a threat at all. Where, if I don't run that many removal spells, and the likelihood is lower than I'm going to draw into another one, I might as well fire it off to kill something right then and there. So in your deck, how many removal spells do you run? Uh, there are a lot. I mean, there, there are 50 instants and sorceries, <laughs> and a lot of them are removal spells of some kind. And sure. especially since a lot of the spells are modal spells, spells where you can choose a lot of different things, quite a few of them have some kind of removal aspect built yeah. in. So I would answer the question, in your shoes, I would not fire off the spell. Mm -hmm. I would just wait and see what I got. But I think it also does depend, though, too, because um, you have the shred memory at this point. So against me, a combo piece that I probably will have to spend a lot of time and effort to get back. Right. Um, that's a big, that's a, that's a backbreaker for me. Yeah. I, I did win. Um, I had a Fauna Shaman in play, and Fauna Shaman is a two-drop elf. For a green and tap, uh, you can discard a creature from your hand and search your library for any creature and put it into your hand. Yeah, it's like a survival of the fittest, but with legs. Yes, so it's exactly. le less expensive, easier to get a hold of. <laughs> yeah. And reanimate in a Mimeoplasm build, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and it also works with, with the Necrotic Ooze, because if it's in my graveyard, Necrotic Ooze now has that ability. Oh, whoa. Um, so, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's really good. Uh, so I had uh, Phyrexian Devour, which is a six-drop artifact creature. I can exile, exile the top card of my library um, and put plus one, plus one counters on it equal to the, the converted mana cost. Um, and you can keep doing that. And I can that. keep doing that. Um, it, has a, it has a clause, right? It does. But my, which is not really relevant. Exactly. So it has a second clause that basically says it dies if its power ever gets greater than seven. But because Necrotic Ooze only gets activated abilities, it doesn't see that. Right. <laughs> and then um, I had Triskelion also in my hand, which says I can remove a plus one, plus one counter to, to shoot somebody for one damage. So I can just make the, the Necrotic Ooze really, really big and just... It's not an infinite combo per se, 
But if you have enough cards in your library, you will kill the whole table with that. Exactly. Yeah. And it's uh, one of those, this is one of those decks where I kind of know exactly how much converted mana cost is left in my deck. So right. I know how much damage I can do at any one point. Right. If the game goes on for a really long time and you only have, you know, ten cards left, you might exactly. run out of gas there. Spoiler but. alert, right? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so the power of the combo is that once Necrotic Ooze hits the battlefield, everything happens at instant speed. So if you try to remove it with, like, a Swords to Plowshares or right. something like that, Garrett can just respond by exiling more cards, removing more plus one, plus one uh, counters. So I think uh, Garrett comboed off, and I had a cap size in my hand, which doesn't interact with the combo. And then I, I got greedy the turn before I cast um, Recurring Insight, which, you know, for six mana lets me draw cards equal to the number of cards in target opponent's hand. Not really relevant what it does. I had a setup turn because I didn't think that uh, Garrett would be able to go off. Or if he did, I, this was my first time playing against Tao's Juleva build, uh, and, and you had a lot of blue mana up, <laughs> and so I just I, kind of assumed, I, I wanted to put pressure on Tao to have to be the one to answer to Garrett if he tried to combo, but uh, I, I neglected to notice that you only had like two cards left in your hand at this right. point. So I I probably misplayed. First game of the day, though. You know, whatever. Yeah, and I think a theme throughout is uh, I, I've, uh, I was keeping up mana across all three games, either having removal spells or bluffing removal or counters um, in the hopes that you guys would play around whatever you thought I had. Game two went very similar to game one. Yes, it was right? shorter. It was very it was much shorter. <laughs> and, um, and, and, I, and I was thinking about it because I, I, uh, I felt like I had the nuts, but it, like even looking at my opening hand, it really wasn't that good. I started with, I think, six lands that hand. Huh. So well, if you just top deck and know what you need from there, that's a, yeah, it could be okay. Yeah, no. Yeah, was, in this game, I was a little my my man was really awkward. I was drawing my basics without drawing any of the fetch lands or the dual lands, hmm. um, and I was like my first three land drops were like island, island, island with like a Rakdos signet. So like I could uh, so the most I could do was hold up two blue. Um, counterspell actually isn't in the deck at all because <laughs> exiling a counterspell to Jaleva. Uh, feels really bad because yeah. you can't cast a counter spell. You don't have a legal target when her ability resolves. So I think uh, we play a few turns. Um, I see Shred Memory again. And Shred Memory is the one that lets you exile cards. For right. Yeah, great. It's the one that yeah. I, I allowed to be reshuffled in the game one with Time Spiral. Yeah. And that was going to be my next uh, draw. And then Garrett won. <laughs> yeah, it was it was like turn four, but I, I I ended up having on the end of Tao's turn three, I frantic searched. Frantic search lets me draw two cards, discard two cards, and untap three lands. So yeah. it's basically a free draw two, discard two. And then I had a an entomb, which basically lets me for one mana search my library, put any creature, any, any card, any card, any I cards. It's crazy. And into my graveyard. So I basically put um, one of my combo pieces into my graveyard that way, discarded one off the frantic search, and then had a necrotic ooze in my hand to cast with four mana open on turn four. Yeah. You, no, and <laughs> you even look at my two, two islands on yes. tap, and you <laughs> okay. ask us, or you just ask the room, no, I, no, should I, I go for it? No, I believe the direct quote was, I'm just going to pretend like Tao doesn't have a count. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did, and he did not, and you won again. Yeah. Yeah. If you get the combo on turn four often, you can just win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was preparing for, you know, a big turn six or a big turn seven, and I just... Yeah, this was a game where uh, I had an opportunity to cast Jaleva. I decided to hold up mana to bluff to right. prevent uh, either of you from trying to combo out oh, that's too interesting. aggressively. <laughs> and, you know... This is a little bit of results-oriented thinking. If I had cast Jaleva, I would have exiled one of Garrett's combo pieces that game. Well, yeah, but that's kind of a foul. You can't get in the habit of thinking about what would no, no, have happened. No, no, absolutely it's not. It's random, you know. My, my whole theory that the universe is a simulation and that your cards are in a state of superposition, blah, blah. Anyway, right. I absolutely agree. You, you can't use kind of the results of one random experiment in order to justify everything. Right. But what I realized after game two was that I'm a little behind on tempo compared to you two guys. Just ge generally? <laughs> yeah, I think overall Garrett's deck is uh, has a lower average converted mana cost than mine yeah. Yeah. because Jaleva wants to play big spells and sometimes you get these big spells stuck in your hand. Yeah. And you ramp like crazy. <laughs> and Jaleva's just there sometimes playing a Signet on turn two and sometimes not. So 
I figured in order to keep up tempo-wise, when we played again, I had to be more aggressive about casting Jaleva. Because Jaleva lets me cast a big spell for free, yes. it lets me keep up with tempo. So that was my decision heading into game three, I need to be more aggressive with Jaleva. Well, and you said something very interesting that I think I disagree with. I, I don't know, it, it would not have made much of a difference in game two, but uh, you, you said you did not cast Jaleva just to bluff. And in a three-player game, I don't know, I feel like I disagree with that. If you don't have a way that you can actually spend the mana, you know, bluffing for me um, is a nice bonus, right? If, if you have mana up that makes it look... Like, if you can tap in such a way that the last two that you're not going to be able to spend anyway happen to be blue-blue, like, that's a nice yeah. bluff to have. But I, I would never forego building a board, I, I don't think, just for the sake of maybe faking out No, I, I think that the exact decision was I only had a Racto Signet to tap for red-black. Yeah. And I had Terminate in my hand. Mm -hmm. So the decision was cast Jaleva and let that be the only thing I do. Yeah. Or to use my Racto Signet to tap for Red Black to terminate your Azusa and possibly bluff Garrett out of comboing out next turn. Yeah, fair enough. So it wasn't just all in bluff or Castileva, it was like not use all my mana to remove a threat and bluff or tap out to play Jaleva. Yeah. yeah, but it was really hard to interact with what Garrett was doing. It was hard to identify him as the threat because a lot of it, most of the setup for the combo happened in your end step right before you yeah. actually comboed mm -hmm. off. Exactly. So we, we didn't and we didn't see. I don't even think I, ca I don't even think I cast a spell that game. Right. Like, I, my first spell was the frantic search. So, so you're two and zero at this point. Going into game three, something needed to change. We needed to adjust our strategies. And so for me, it was, you know, mulligan maybe a little more aggressively or just make sure that I have a, a few more ways to interact and, and be a little more conservative in my plays, too. Make sure that, um, you know, I leave the mana up to cast a Cyclonic Rift rather than trying to greedily have a setup turn. Like I said, I was going to be a little more aggressive in casting Jaleva. Um, just because uh, not only could I potentially nab your combo pieces with Jaleva's exile ability, but it would help me keep up in terms of just number of spells cast over the course of the, like the first few turns. Sure. So you did wind up casting Jaleva. Yeah, uh, I, I got a Felwar Stone, so I was able to ramp a little bit and cast Jaleva on turn three of this of game three. And lo and behold, <laughs> I exile Garrett's Triskelion, yeah. which is a crucial <laughs> combo piece. And Dan, I exile your Freed from the Real and a Debt to the Deathless. Yeah, you exile the way that I go infinite with mana anyway, which is um, it, it's an enchantment, two colorless and a blue enchant creature. Uh, for one blue, you can untap it. Or for blue, you can tap it. I never use that mode. But uh, basically, on any of my mana dorks that untap lands, if that land produces more than one mana, and one of <laughs> that mana is blue, that is infinite mana, right? Because I always use the blue to untap it, and then I just net more and more and more and more. And usually it's infinite of every color. Like if I have a market festival, an enchant land that says whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana, add two mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool on top of what it normally produces, right? That's just infinite of all five colors, and then um, Debt to the Deathless is for X, white, white, black, black. Each opponent loses two times X life, and you gain life equal to the life loss this way. So normally X is infinite, and they lose infinite, and I gain infinite times two. Uh, but even if you don't have infinite mana, my deck is good at making, you know, 24 mana, which is enough to deal or not deal, but make opponents lose 40 life with a Debt to the Deathless, which, unless you're playing against an Aloro player, is normally enough to do it. But. <laughs> like, it was pure luck. You know, no skill involved, or no planning involved in exiling these. Well, but you make your own luck, in the sure. sense that you cast the Jaleva on turn three, and you made a conscious decision that you were going to try to cast her early, and it worked to great effect there. So, what were you guys thinking at this point, now that kind of part of your primary win conditions are now in the exile zone. I've built my deck around this. <laughs> I have a demonic tutor in hand, and I've also got a rift sweeper. And a rift sweeper is literally a bear. It's a two mana two two that lets me take a card from exile and shuffle it back into my library. Yeah, it's, it's the one perfect <laughs> answer. Before Garrett cast the Demonic Tutor into uh, the Rift Sweeper, I was feeling pretty good, actually, about the Jaleva, because, to my mind, the way that Garrett had won the previous two games was no longer viable, and I still had an infinite combo in my deck. That is Eternal Witness plus Time Stretch 
plus cap size. Basically, time stretch for 10 mana says target player takes two extra turns after this one. It doesn't exile itself, which is probably a design flaw. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I cast Eternal Witness for one green green. It's a 2-1 creature. When it enters the battlefield, return target card from my graveyard to my hand. So then on my first extra turn, I recast time stretch. And then I can... Capsize with buyback. Capsize for one blue blue. It says return target permanent to its owner's hand, and you can buy it back for three colorless mana. So between the three of those, as long as you have enough mana, you can continually capsize with buyback the eternal witness, recast it, get back the time stretch, cast time stretch again, do it all over again, take infinite yeah. turns, and eventually win somehow. So that was my plan B, right? Uh, and, and I felt okay about it. Then as soon as you rift, rift swept, I think would be the, yeah. the, the past tense of I, rift sweep, right? Exactly. When one piece gets exiled, it's not the end of the world. So. Both of you are kind of set back, but not out of it yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's something to just keep in mind when you're playing against combo decks in EDH, that is that usually they have a backup plan. At this point, um, I felt good. I felt good about having this kind of impact on the game, but I needed to figure out how I was going to actually win. I think for the next couple of turns, I'm just sitting on uh, Mystic Confluence, which is, uh, for this purpose, it's a counterspell. Cryptic Command, which is another counterspell, and a Dig Through Time, which can draw me into other counterspells. <laughs> so uh, I was feeling pretty confident, but really I just had, I was still in Shields Up mode. That happens frequently with decks that are new. It's like you have the thing you want to do with them, but you're not quite sure how to finish things off. So I, I assume that in, you know, the the beta version or the, 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 the next version of your deck, uh, you might find a way to shoehorn in some sort of... Do you have a, do you have a rough idea as to what you want to do with Jaleva from here? No, and, and uh, although it sounds like I'm criticizing my deck in, in this aspect, um, Jaleva was kind of designed like this. It's very tutor light. Yeah. I mean, there are certain combos that can kind of explode for lots of damage. Um, they usually involve copying a big spell over and over again. Right. But uh, the deck doesn't have... Uh, it wasn't built with all-out competitiveness in mind. It, it definitely made playing out the rest of the game a little more difficult. I had to figure out what I wanted to do based on what was going to be exiled with Jaleva and what I drew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that plan B I was talking about, where I loop with Eternal Witness and capsize into infinite turns with a time stretch, there was an interesting sequence of events where I think, Tao, you cast something that was going to kill one of my mana dorks, and mm -hmm. I had the ability to produce exactly eight mana, um, and I wanted to hold up seven mana for a Cyclonic Rift that I could cast with Overload, which just returns all non-land permanents that your opponents control to their owner's hands. But if I wanted to do that and also have mana uh, for a Mystical Tutor in my hand, which is for a blue instant speed, search your library for an instant or sorcery, and put it on top of your library, because you were killing my creature, I needed to basically untap that land right away and use that mana for the Mystical Tutor so I still have seven left for the Psych Rift. So I cast a Mystical Tutor to get the cap size on mm -hmm. top of my library, that one combo piece. You guys knew that the cap size was there, and I mean, I guess this was right in front of my face and I just didn't see that this was a potential line of play. But, but one of the spells that Tau had exiled with Jaleva the last time he cast her was a Pyroblast, which is for one red mana, it's an instant, um, counter target blue spell or destroy target blue permanent. And, you know, I was looking at this thinking, okay, well, I better not play my future side or I better not play a blue mm -hmm. permanent that Tau can destroy with it. Completely neglecting to consider that you could pyroblast your own Jaleva yeah, and, uh, and then recast her. <laughs> one of the fun aspects of playing with a commander like Jaleva is that after a while you actually want your commander to die because you get the benefit from her when you recast her. <laughs> so when Jaleva runs out of useful spells, you want her to die. And there's this little dance that goes around with no one wants to kill her and you really want to kill her. And... <laughs> Um, so, yeah, the Pyroblast was sitting on their Jaleva. It was the last relevant spell, um, and when you put the capsize on, I attacked with Jaleva. Uh. Pyroblasted Jaleva. Jaleva's a blue permanent, after all. Yeah, right. And I got to recast her for six, this time exiling top six. Which exiled my capsize. Which, exiled which, which means now I really don't have an infinite combo left. Yeah, And unlike Garrett, I don't run a Rift Sweeper. I don't have a way to get back cards once they're exiled. It's just gone. So... The, the note that I made here is this might be a progenitus game. I might have to cast my 10-10 ten, ten 
protection from everything and just try to beat face. <laughs> Which, yeah. Uh, it t- t- put, put me very much in a control role at that point. Mm-hmm. I was just waiting and letting you two kind of go at it for uh, a while as soon as I lost that cap size. This is the flavor win of the day. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you tre- Treasured Find. Treasure Find is a uh, green and black sorcery that is uh, did, puts any card from my graveyard back into my hand and exiles itself. So Treasure Cruise is the treasure that I found, or right. the treasure find. Um, <laughs> it, which, makes, it makes, it's so, it's beautiful. It's, it's like they were designed to do that. Exactly. Like, and at this point, I was pretty, kind of, like, set up to uh, combo again because I had a bunch of dredge cards um, in my graveyard. Right. Stingweed Imp is one example. Dredge 5. Dredge 5 says, uh, if you would draw a card, instead you may put exactly five cards from the top of your library into your graveyard. If you do, return this card from your graveyard to your hand. Otherwise, draw a card. Huh. Um, so, I just think we'd have been a couple of the dredgers in my graveyard, um, putting five, eight, ten cards in my graveyard every single turn. And I think at this point, uh, once Garrett started dredging, uh, a kind of a, a path to victory, not a great one, started appearing for me because Garrett milled over a Massacre Worm, hmm. which is uh, a 6-5, six, 6-mana six black creature. When it enters the battlefield, it gives all of your opponent's creatures minus 2, minus 2, and then when an opponent's creature dies, they lose 2 life. Yeah. So it's just something to attack with. It's a fatty. Yeah. yeah, and given that you know everyone's decks are a little more combo-oriented, they're a little more susceptible to just attacking. Right. So Because normally we're trying to win the game before life totals really matter. <laughs> right. And, but so if you've exiled our combo pieces... And with my second cast of Jaleva, not only did I exile Dan's capsize, I also nab one of Garrett's reanimation spells. Actually, just reanimate. Yeah. Attack with Jaleva, cast reanimate on Massacre Worm, and now I have this... Very slow clock, but at least but, now there was some kind of pressure that would force you guys to win sooner than later. I think it was the next turn or the turn afterwards. Almost got a little bit repetitive, but I was like, I've got the uh, the Necrotic Ooze in my hand, and I've got a uh, Triskillian and Frexian Devourer in my graveyard. Cast it. You had the Cavern of Souls. Cavern of Souls. It was uncounterable. I was like feeling pretty good. Thought I was going to win. And then Tau. Shred Memory makes its third appearance to me Woo-hoo! in these three games. The first uh, remember in game it. one, it was reshuffled with Time Spiral. Game two was on the top of my library and never got drawn. Game three, it was sitting in my hand for like seven turns. Necrotic was on the stack. I exile the Triskelion, the Phyrexian Devourer, you the mean. Sage of Hours, and then another creature that gives Infect, right? It has an right. active ability that gives itself Infect. Yes. I forget to the exile Rift the Rift Sweeper. <laughs> <laughs> so I still have a game plan at this point. <laughs> so Garrett made a comment that I, I cited in a card for his deck. Don't believe him. Shred Memory is a great EDH card. Yeah. Simply because I have yet to play against another good EDH deck that did not use its graveyard in some way. And, and even if it doesn't, you can, you can trans- transmute for right. Cyclonic Rift. Exactly, exactly. I set Garrett way back. He still yeah. has Rift Sweeper, but it's going to take him turns to get all of his combo pieces back. And even but I'm doing gonna... it. I'm doing it. <laughs> well, yeah. even then they're going to be shuffled into the library, yes. so it's going right. to take you yeah. know, a stroke of luck. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm milling ten cards a turn. Yeah, Dredge, so... Dredge 6 helps with these things. At this point, my attention is on keeping Dan back. A, a few turns go on where I am deliberately sitting back, trying not to play into this uh, Decree of Pain mm-hmm. that I see. Decree of Pain, by the way, for, what is it, 6 black black... Um, not that you would have to cast it, it would have been cast for free from, from Jaleva. For free off of Jaleva, but... Destroy all creatures, they can't be regenerated, and then I get to draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. Right, so I'm just kind of hanging back, drawing cards, and the three cards I'm sitting on for the longest time are Time Stretch, Time Spiral, and Dark Petition. <laughs> and my goodness, in, in my Progenitus deck, those three cards, if I think that there aren't going to be any answers to them, I can do it. Anything and everything I want to. With time stretch gives me two extra turns. Time spiral we've already talked about shuffles everything back into the library and everyone draws seven cards. And dark petition um, for three colorless black black is a demonic tutor. Search your library for a card, put it in your hand. But if you have uh, two or more instants or sorceries in your graveyard, uh, it adds three black mana to your mana pool after the fact. So it basically costs. Two mana. So at this point, um, I I had a windfall in my graveyard, and windfall basically says each player discards their hand and uh, draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards discarded this way. Tau has seven cards in hand. My thought is draw seven cards sounds pretty good, especially with three dredge cards. Three dredge cards actually lets me get through, uh, I think, almost 20 cards in my library. Yeah. 
Windfall sounds pretty good at this point. It was in my graveyard, so I think I cast like a reanimate targeting Snapcaster Mage. We've come all of this way, and I have a repeat of my decision from game one, which is uh, I think I have a Cyclonic Rift in my hand. Not enough mana to overload it. Mm -hmm. And I could just cast it on one of your untappers that's in play. One of mine, yeah. Just to set you back a turn. Right. And again, I have five mana up, and I'm thinking, do I do this or hope to draw seven cards into a better answer? Maybe a kill spell, maybe like uh, Silimgar's Command, which is a, which has Negate stapled onto it as one of its yeah, modes. Counter-target non-creature spell, yeah. Again, I make the choice of, let me just dump my hand and hope to draw into better answers and... I end up not drawing into any answers, <laughs> which now leads into... Well, so I was initially bummed about the Windfall because I told you the three cards I had. Yeah. I mean, even though it was only three, I could. I, the world was my oyster with those three. I had searched through my library because I used the Fetch Land at this point, so I knew exactly what I had left. Um, my Necrotic Ooze combo was no longer relevant because I think I had like... 12 cards in my library at this right. point. Right. Um, so I couldn't exile cards from the top of my library to kill anybody anymore. But what I did have was I had a uh, Skitherix, the Blight Dragon, uh, which has Infect, and, and Haste. So what I was going to do is I, I basically could put it into my graveyard at the end of Tao's turn and then kill somebody by using the Mimeoplasm to reanimate it with a bunch of plus one plus one counters and infect somebody. But that assumes Tao will have a next turn to have the end of. This is why I kept asking, did you, Dan? How are you going to kill us both? And you said... <laughs> well, what? no, I didn't think I was going to. Exactly. I, I really didn't. You, one thing that we didn't mention is you cast something, Garrett, that uh, allowed everyone to return one creature from their graveyard oh, to yeah. play. Um, and I had a Crozen Restorer, which is another dork that untaps uh, lands. But if you have Threshold, uh, which is seven or more cards in your graveyard, you can untap three lands, which is crazy value. Note to self... Look at his grief here before I uh, use an exhum. In, in fairness, you know, all the mana in the world doesn't mean anything if you don't have anything to do with it. And until my draw step of my next turn, I didn't have what I needed. But I top decked a Jeskai Ascendancy, which I had kind of forgotten about. I, I thought, I can't go infinite. And it's not really infinite, but it's like pseudo arbitrary infinite mana. That turn was ridiculous. Jeskai Ascendancy for, you know, red, white, blue, one of each mana, just three total, um, is an enchantment that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, um, untap all creatures you control and they get plus one plus one until end of turn, not that that was really relevant. And uh, you may draw a card and then discard a card. Mm -hmm. So effectively what it allows me to do with all of my dorks that untap lands is... You know, I tap the dorks to float maybe six mana with lands that tap for three mana each. Uh, then I cast some sort of instant or sorcery, trigger on Jeskai Ascendancy, untap the dorks. I've netted four mana, and everything's untapped again, and we do it all over again. Hopefully these instants and sorceries are allowing me to, um, you know, draw more cards and just kind of keep getting more and more gas. And, you know, even though it's not a loop technically that we're recurring in the same way every time, it, it often is pseudo-infinite mana. You had an abrupt decay in your hand and what, what, what does that do? What's the specific it, wording of that? It's a green black uh, uncounterable instant right. that destroys target permanent, non-land permanent with converted mana cost three or less. Yeah. What wound up happening was you let the Jeskai Ascendancy resolve and then as soon as I tried to untap my land since it's not a mana ability, priority does pass with the, the dorks that untap lands and in response to that you cast abrupt decay targeting the Jeskai Ascendancy to which I responded to with about a 10-minute sequence of instant spells. I went to the bathroom twice in this period. <laughs> twice. Not just once. Twice. Well, you are a little sick to be. Yeah, it's true. It's true. If you can't hear it in my voice. More, more, more frequent bathroom trips. Anyway, what are we talking about? So your question was, if when Jeskai Ascendancy was still on the stack, you had cast an Abrupt Decay targeting one of my two mana dorks, if you had... Cast it to kill my Crozen Restorer, because you couldn't have killed the Agrathian Elder because it cost four. Would I have been able to generate as much mana as I did? I think I still would have gone off. Right. It wouldn't have been exactly the same. Although, then I would have still had a Jeskai Ascendancy that would have triggered for my sorceries in my hand and for my enchantments in my hand. So I might have actually netted even more mana had you done right. it that way. I, I think you did it as best as you could have. Um, but with the Abrupt Decay on the stack, the Jeskai Ascendancy is still in play. And so I can still cast instant to bank mana, uh, untap my dorks again, 
and draw more cards, and then cast another instant, and then make more mana. And I, I did this, I probably cast six or seven spells with Abrupt Decay on the stack. And at this point, after casting the spells, you had like 28 mana floating. I think I had more than that. I think I had somewhere in the neighborhood of like 40, which enabled me to cast a Time Warp, and then I tutored for an Eternal Witness, and then I returned the Time Stretch to my hand, and I cast that to get two extra turns, so I had three extra turns stacked up after this, and then I cast Progenitus, my commander, and then I cast Future Sight, which is an enchantment that lets me uh, play with the top card of my library revealed, and I may play it as though it was in my hand. This is referred to as a Wombo Storm, <laughs> or a Wombo Combo. It's where I'm basically playing solitaire and my opponents are just... Going to the bathroom. You go into the bathroom, <laughs> you know, drinking some water, being like, you done yet? Are we dead yet? I did Wombo Storm into a win. Normally the win is a combo, but since my combo pieces were exiled by Tau, what I had to do was uh, I had a Kessig Wolf Run, which is a land that says X, tap, red, green. Um, target creature gets plus X, plus O, and trample until end of turn. I could generate enough mana to give my Eternal Witness literally plus... 50 plus 0 and trample until end of turn, and that was enough to kill Garrett. And then with my three turns stacked up, I could swing yeah, at Tau. Yeah, you have three progenitor attacks which that is you could use. 30 commander damage, and, and so I, I did wind up winning. I, I think you did eventually scoop. You didn't make me go through all of the motions. Well, my, my one in inclination was I still had the Scytherix in my hand. My, right. my, my Blight Dragon, I was, I was like, I could kill one of you guys next turn, possibly both of you. I made him go through enough of it to show us that he was actually going to kill us both. Yeah. Um, and then my other thought was I still had um, the Phyrexian Devourer back in my graveyard at this point because of my Rift Sweeper. Yeah. So my Necrotic Ooze could get to a, I think it was like a 2020 at this point. I had a 2020 blocker, so I was like, maybe I'm not dead. And yeah. No, I was st still dead. Yeah, you're still pretty dead there. But it was a weird game where both of the combo decks were forced onto their plan B. Well, I, for me, it was plan C. I think that's the first time I've actually cast Progenitus with that deck, let alone one with Progenitus, right? The one awkward non-bow is I cannot target Progenitus with my own Kessig Wolfram. No. Because it has protection from it. <laughs> protection Kessig Wolfram is a thing. Yeah, no. I, I, yeah, it, yeah, it has protection from no, every, everything. Everything. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> stop sneezing! Oh, I'm, I'm trying to do the outro, Garrett! Hold on. <laughs> Garrett, stop it! I can't help it. <laughs> Once again, I want to remind you that uh, this podcast is now available on iTunes. There's a link in the description, or at least more info in the description. I'm, I, th I think I can link directly to it. I'm not sure how this whole iTunes business works, but we're, we're getting it figured out. And if you want to support Tandem Tactics, um, there's a link in the description also to uh, Pogo Bat Gaming's Patreon page, where you can pledge to uh, give a monthly donation, which helps to make this whole enterprise uh, sustainable. So consider doing that, and... Until next time, I'm Garrett. I'm Tao. And I'm Dan. Have a good night. And you should have a good night and afternoon and morning. No, no, don't have a good morning. Oh, have you have, have an average morning. <laughs> okay, we can stop the recording. Great. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Wait? No, I'm joking. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh. No, I'm joking. Okay, okay. Wait. Oh, uh. oh okay. Oh, yeah. Bye, guys. Uh.